Hello and welcome. Um, welcome to today's webinar, CME Term SOFR, Gaining Momentum Globally. My name is Diana Rodriguez. I'm Vice President International Policy at BAFT, and I'm pleased to be joined today by two colleagues from CME Group, Marco Bianchi, who's Executive Director, Client Development and Sales, and Gavin Lee, Global Head of CME Benchmark Administration. Welcome to you both. Before turning it over to the two of you, I just want to provide a couple of words of context on the word on the work that BAFT has been doing in the LIBOR transition space for several years now. Of course, we are now in 2022. Several tenors of USD LIBOR have now ceased, as have LIBOR in the other global currencies. Um, but what we've seen, what we've seen now is that in the final months of 2021, US regulators were clear. Um, in the regulatory guidance stating that banks need to employ risk management plans to pivot away from LIBOR to alternative rates. Since the ARC endorsed the CME term SOFA rate late last summer, there has been a significant uptick in use. Indeed, just this month, we've seen um, additional progress in banks transitioning to the CME term rate, and we were pleased to see U.S. regulators acknowledge the importance of a term rate for the trade finance industry. Regardless of which rate an institution chooses to transition to, bank examiners will want to see that a bank is meeting safety and soundness principles laid out by regulators. Banks should have a clear understanding of the composition of the rates they intend to use, which is why it is important to have these interactions, such as the one that we're having today with CME Group, um, and have transition plans in place um, for committed and uncommitted facility, uh, facilities alike. Um, Certainly, what we have seen, especially pick up steam this year, has been an increased dialogue with, between banks and their corporate clients and a renewed willingness, willingness to engage to remediate contracts and to effectively transition um, beyond LIBOR. Over the next weeks and months, the trade finance industry would like to see the ARC formally endorse the 12 month term SOFA rate. We were pleased to see the CME Group begin publication of that rate late last year. Um, and we as the, in the working group will continue to have discussions and hope to see additional coalescence around a credit adjustment spread, um, which is one of the enduring challenges as we pivot away from LIBOR to alternative reference rates. Um, late last year, I want to ensure that members of the BAF community are aware that we published an amendment to the master participation agreement, taking into account the cessation of LIBOR. We invite members to download those. They're available both for the New York law and the English law version of the MPAs. Um, we invite you to join us as we continue to monitor progress um, in this transition away from LIBOR. But given the importance of US dollar, again, I'm very pleased to be joined by Marco and Gavin, who will spend some time with us today um, discussing the term rate, um, and how banks can begin and continue to utilize it as we transition away from LIBOR. So Marco, Gavin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for your partnership and we look forward to engaging with you today. Marco? Hi, this is Gavin. Um, I'll, 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 I'll start the presentation. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting us to, to, to speak today. Um, about CME term SOFA reference rates and uh, how they can be accessed and how they can be used. Um, but before we go into the details of um, term SOFA, I thought it might be useful just to give some background on CME Group Benchmark Administration Limited or, or CBA, the CME Group entity with overall responsibility for benchmarks and indices. CBA is registered as a benchmark administrator. It's authorised and supervised by the UK Financial Conduct Authority or the FCA. And we currently have somewhere in the order of um, over 60 benchmarks under administration. And that covers most asset classes, as you can see on the slides in front of you. All of our benchmarks are calculated using data from CME Group's highly liquid and regulated futures and options markets and the FX and cash markets. And that allows us to provide transparent, robust and reliable benchmarks. If you could, um, thank you. Um, so CME term SOFA reference rates are a forward looking estimate of um, overnight SOFA. They're calculated and published for one month, three month, six month and 12 month tenors. The calculations are, ex are, are, are based on executed trades and executable bids and offers on, on CME futures contracts. And those futures contracts are both the one month and the three month um, SOFA contracts. 
In quarter four 2021, CME term SOFA was calculated using those contracts with an average daily volume of 150,000 contracts traded, or that equates to $260 billion in notional per day. What that results in is a robust and liquid data set that we use um, as the basis of the calculation. CME term SOFA is endorsed and recommended by the ARC, and it's designed to meet industry best practices and follow the IOSCO principles for financial benchmarks. In addition, CME term SOFA is also regulated and registered under, under benchmark regulation, and it's supervised by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. Um, that means that it is available for use by uh, regulated firms in both the EU and the UK at this time. As with any regulated benchmark, transparency is key and details of the calculation methodology, governance and other relevant documents are made available on CME Term Sofa webpage. In terms of the guiding principles, um, use of CME Term Sofa will require a commercial agreement with CME. The structure of the agreement um, is in the form of an information license agreement or an ILA and um, any required schedules that go along with that will be um, appendices to that. So you can kind of regard this a little bit like um, a, a, a general master agreement with the schedules sort of forming the um, individual um, application um, as, as is required. The license is at a group level and it's based on standard terms and conditions that apply equally to all customers and all clients. And whilst we are independent, CME um, licensing policies are aligned to the ARC's best practice recommendations for scope of use of term SOFA. And what, what I mean by that is we, we, we actually agree and believe that the use of um, term SOFA in derivatives should be limited to avoid the inverted pyramid and ensure that the use does not detract from um, volumes in SOFA linked derivatives that are used as input to the calculation of term SOFA itself. Um, so to take us into some of the, um, the uh, types of licenses and the, um, and the way in which you can enter or, 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 or communicate and start to talk about those licenses, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, uh, Marco. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, appreciate the update on the framework that underpins the creation and distribution of CME term so far. Uh, if we could please move on to the next slide. Uh, we're going to spend the next few minutes covering uh, a few core themes. The first one is we're going to discuss the different license types that are made available to market participants by CBA and CME group in order to be able to embrace term SOFA and access the rate as well as use it. And then we're going to drill down a little bit in some of the use cases as they relate to cash markets, derivatives markets, and other segments of the marketplace that make use of CME term SOFA. And then in the end, I'll provide a summary of the steps, the call to action and the steps that you can actually take to be able to secure a license. But first things first, let's look at different license types that are uh, in existence today. As Gavin alluded, a license is required both in order to access as well as use CME term software. On the access front, we have display licenses that allow the term software to be displayed on a terminal or a screen. Um, and you can obtain a, an access license directly with CME group or uh, from a distributor or a vendor with which you may have an existing agreement like a Bloomberg or an Affinitive. On the non-display front, we also make available licenses and access to the rate for systems or applications or algorithms or other softwares to be able to consume the rate. And for this non-display use of CME term software, you can only license directly with CME group. Moving on to the use licenses. Again, a use license is required by a firm that wants to use CME term software reference rates as an input or a reference in pricing, valuation, transactional or benchmarking activities. And these use licenses can only be obtained directly with CME group. A license is also required by vendors or service providers um, who offer commercial products or services provided to their clients, such as administration or custody services. And it's important to note at this point, uh, an important distinction that an end user 
does not need a use license for CME or software simply to enter into a transaction. So take, for example, a borrower doesn't necessarily need a license for term software just for the borrowing. However, if the end user, the borrower, wants to use term software in a system for evaluation or analysis or risk management, collateral management, other activities, then a use license would be required. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, we're going to spend a couple of minutes on each one of the category of licenses that are made available to the market today. There are three categories. The first one is category one, and it's for use in cash market financial products. Uh, this type of category one license is available to the marketplace at no cost through 2026, so for five years. Um, under category one, term software is available for use as a primary or a fallback reference for cash market financial products, such as loans, mortgages, bonds, money market instruments, floating rate notes, bank notes, and the likes. The use includes any calculation of things like interest amounts, default rates, closeout calculations, valuation, pricing, collateral, and the likes. Having a category one license also allows for communications and disclosures to end users in connection with these type of transactions in cash market financial products. Uh, one important point to note is that when you're converting or transitioning a cash market financial product to CME term SOFR, as soon as the fallback is triggered, then uh, term SOFR becomes the primary reference, then a license is required. So it's worth thinking in advance about fallbacks. Under category two licenses, we're now going to focus on OTC derivatives markets and products. Now, for these type of license, category two, there is a fee schedule that we publish. I'll point to the resources where we make the information available at the end of the presentation. But in essence, it's a maximum fee of up to $8,000 per year for firms whose assets exceed $10 billion. And it's tiered at lower levels. Uh, again, based on the assets that are on the firm's balance sheet. So as we mentioned earlier, there are specific permissible uses of CME term sofa that are allowed in terms of OTC derivative products. And these users are limited to transactions that are tied to or linked to hedging end user exposure for one or more cash market financial products that reference the same TME, CME term sofa reference rates. So OTC derivatives products include swaps, forwards, warrants, options, and other similar derivatives products. And there's a list that I'm going to cover in a minute that gives you additional examples. And then finally, on the category three, um, this is for treasury and risk and transaction administration services. We made these um, license available more recently after we rolled out category one and category two in Q4 of last year. Uh, the fees associated with this category three uh, license are 15,000 for the delayed access to the data and $30,000 US dollars real time. We have waived all these fees through the first half of this year, 2022. And so this is where uh, one uses term software as an input um, to a data product or a service that it's offered to clients to help them manage their treasury or risk management activities or provide or when you provide transaction administration services. These activities and services are linked to the use of CME term software and cash market financial products, category one, and OTC derivatives products in case you know we're looking at a category two license. And they include services that provide interest rate, collateral calculations, portfolio evaluations, asset performance reports, and forward-looking curves. We could move on to the next slide, please. So in summary, CME term software is available directly from CME group or through certain authorized vendor partners, such as Bloomberg and Refinitiv. As we discussed, uh, a category one license is required for use of term software as a reference in the creation of cash market financial products. A category two license covers the use of TME, CME term software as a reference in OTC derivatives hedges that are tied or linked to end user exposure in a cash market product. 
And then finally, category three is required by service providers when they use terms offer in the provision of commercial offerings that include treasury, risk, and transaction administration services. Again, it's important to note the distinction that an end user does not necessarily require a license simply to be the counterparty in a cash market product or OTC derivative hedge. However, when the end user decides to utilize the rate in systems for internal calculations, analysis, and some of the applications that we described, then a license is required. And again, an important reminder about fallbacks when CME term software is used as a result of a fallback trigger, um, not just for new business as we are now in 2022, um, it's important to be able to put a license in place to support that fallback trigger. So um, we encourage all market participants to act and to engage. And if we can flip to the last slide, we wanted to share with you some resources. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, if possible, where we um, have provided links that allow you to access our FAQ documents that drill down in greater depth on many of the themes that we covered at relatively high level today. There is further information about the methodology that CME utilizes, as you know, Gavin described, to calculate and make available uh, term SOFA rates. There are samples, examples of the licensing agreements, the details on the fees, and then critically, when you look at the bottom right of the screen, CME Group Data Sales, there's an email address that you can use to contact us and we'll make sure to engage with you directly and provide the resources to be able to guide you and assist the process of licensing um, uh, on your behalf. So with that, I hope we covered some useful content. I will pause here in case there are questions or uh, other themes that we want to address. As a reminder to all who are joining us today, please feel free to type in the Q&A box any questions and we'll be able to see questions for Gavin or Marco. We'll give everyone a couple of minutes. Um, Okay, I see one question just came in. Happy to read it off to you, Gavin and Marco. Will the CME term SOFR be required for prior contracts that pre previously used LIBOR? So um, I think a lot of that is going to, it's a good question. A lot of that's gonna depend on, as Marco was talking about the fallback provisions in existing, um, the existing contracts. And so if those fallback provisions do, um, do state that you will you will use the um, the arc recommended rate, which is one fallback provision that we have seen. Then term sofa will be the required um, fallback, and in those circumstances, at the point of fallback, um, when the CME term sofa becomes the primary rate in the transaction, a license will be required. So for existing con for existing contracts, a lot of it is going to depend on what the provisions actually state within the existing agreements. Great, thanks, Kevin. A couple of other questions that came in, I think I'll pose both of these to you and certainly the theme of today's discussion. Um, what adoption trends for term SOFR are you seeing developing in the market? Have you seen an acceleration since the start of 2022? Um, we, we certainly saw an acceleration in the latter half of next year, and that is continuing into 2022. And you know, since the endorsement by the ARC, there's been a steady growth in the number of firms that um, are selecting CME Term Sofa as their uh, as their key tool to manage um, lending and financing and investment risk. Um, to date, we've seen well over 2,000 licenses um, across over five 500 firms. 
um, to use TermSOFA as their primary reference rate. And, and this distribution covers a broad range of participants, including regional banks, private and direct lenders, insurance firms, asset managers, hedge funds, you know, the, the, the likes, and, and, and across all regions as well. So you know, we're seeing that across, across North America, we're seeing it across EMEA, and we're seeing it um, across um, APAC as well. So, you know, we're seeing that there's, um, that the market is embracing TermSofa, and of course we're, you know, very um, excited about the, the the response that we've seen across the uh, BAF membership globally as well, and 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 we're grateful to, to to BAF for you know providing us this opportunity to talk to talk to your membership and and and, and explain a little bit more and ensure that your members are aware of what what TermSofa is and, and 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 how it can be used, and we do encourage that if if you do have um, some fallback provisions that will require you to use TermSofa, then we do encourage you to contact um, uh, the, the, the team at CME um, sooner rather than later to ensure that you have everything in place for when that fallback provision actually kicks in. Great. Several other questions have come in. Um, maybe I'll read a couple and give you an opportunity to look at the other ones that are coming in. Um, there's a question about historical data. Um, a member was curious if you provide historical data for CME term sober. So Marco, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, we do. We do. Uh, there is a specific product service that CME offers. It's called CME Data Mine, and it's something that can be accessed online. And we can certainly, um, you know, uh, put you in touch directly with our colleagues who manage the service. But basically. Um, we make those ref those historical um, rates available uh, going back through September 2020, and you know a lot of firms have used historical information to you know for simulations or um, in order to you know study or provide valuations on the way forward. We also make the uh, historical data available through some of the vendors. Um, those are view only, so for deeper analysis, it's probably better than you uh, contact CME and. We can certainly put you in touch with the um, data mine guys and, and provide that service. Great. There was a question. I know you spent the latter part of the presentation discussing licensing. A uh, question came in asking if CBA is looking at developing additional licensing categories for TermSofer. Yeah, so as, as we mentioned in the, um, in, in, in the presentation that we, uh, we expanded the, uh, the the license quite recently from a category one and a category two, which is cash market and OTCs, um, to add um, a category three for kind of service provision and, and 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 service providers. And you know, as a as a benchmark administrator, we're constantly um, assessing the market needs and reviewing use cases with um, market practitioners and 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 with the regulators on a on on, on a regular basis. And and, and, and whilst our licensing um, is separate, as I mentioned, um, from the ARC recommendations on TermSofa, um, we are uh, we do support those recommendations. And so, um, as additional licensing, you know, categories will be made available to support any new or expanded recommendations from the ARC. So, so we will be working with the with with the ARC in terms of as they expand their recommended use cases, we will look at at, at expanding our, our our licensing to support that. I, I did see I did see a couple of questions that came up, um, and there was more than one which kind of caught my attention about the twelve month rate. So, so perhaps I should I, I, I should address that one as well, if that's okay. And so the questions were um, around, um, you know, um, has has the ARC uh, endorsed or recommended the twelve month rate at this time? And and I think the answer to that is. Um, not at this time. So the ARC formally announced its endorsement of the one, three, and six month rate um, back in, uh, in, in, in 2021. CME has been producing a 12 month rate um, for some time now. And we do expect that the 12 month rate um, will be evaluated by the ARC for endorsement. However, the time frame as to when the ARC looks at doing that will be determined by the ARC. It is worth me noting that the, uh, the, the 12 month uh, the 12-month rate is aligned with our one, three, and six-month benchmark. 
um, and um, they, it does meet IOSCO standards and it also falls within the um, benchmark regulation standards as well. So uh, it is a regulated benchmark. It is there. We have the support. We have the, the, uh, the documentation. We have the methodology all in place to, to, um, to, to, to support its use. Um, and we, we look forward to the ARC um, expediting its recommendation and endorsement. I'll just, I'll just note from a BAF perspective, that is something that we've raised both with the Fed and the ARC and something that um, we've made the case that it is important for the industry to ensure that the ARC does move forward in that regard. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of questions coming in. I'm happy to um, share some one, one of you, um, I know, let's see, there's a question about plans for a one week term sober. Yeah, so um, I guess at, at, at this time, uh, we are not adding additional granularity to the to to the term rate. So um, we feel that, you know, based on based on the Fed and um, and the ARC and the various other sort of global regulators recommendations, um, in terms of their use of term sofa, um, a one month, a three month, a six month, and a um, and a, and a twelve month covers um, covers that uh, that that recommended usage um, the way that it is anticipated. Um, so at this point in time, we do not have a plan to um, to add additional tenors, and we'll have to see how how, how things pan out um, in 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 terms of going forward. But that our, our plans don't don't go beyond those tenors today. Um, sticking to tenors, maybe I can ask this question um, following up on your comments, Gavin, on the 12-month tenor. Um, there's a question, um, is the 12-month tenor based on real contracts and how is the volume in comparison to one, three, and six months? Yes, so the uh, all of the all of the calculations are based on on transaction volume. So it's 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 transaction volume and executable bids and offers. And so we we, we look at the the the, the various um, contracts within within CME. So as I mentioned, we we the calculation for term sofa is based on um, thirteen um, consecutive expiries of the one month futures contract. So that takes you out 13 months. And it also is um, based on um, five consecutive expiries of the three month futures contract. And so we have, um, we have the, uh, the executed and executable volumes for all of that data um, being pulled into, into the calculation. As I mentioned, um, you know, that's, that's $260 billion worth of um, average daily volume. So um, we have quite a, um, a robust pool of, of, of transactions to make those calculations. Great. Um, several questions coming in specific to how the trade finance industry can leverage the CME term SOFA rate, um, specifically export letter of credit, for example, or cases where interest must be deducted up front. Um, I don't know if either of you want to tackle that. I will share from a back perspective that was one of the big arguments that we made to the ARC and to the Fed and the necessity for a term rate in order to be able to do so. But perhaps one of the two of you want to comment on how trade finance can um, leverage CME term separate. Um, I, I might actually pass you over to um, one of our other colleagues who's on the call, uh, Tim, Tim, Tim Moran, who um, can perhaps um, offer some, some, some insights into that. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Gavin. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, CME term SOFR can certainly be used to calculate the, um, the discounts <clears throat> on uh, discounts up front on those types of loans. Um, and as Diana was saying, that was really one of the um, uh, arguments being put forth to the ARC as to why a term SOFA rate was so important to the trade finance community. Um, uh, CME term SOFA is, is very, very similar to LIBOR in terms of calculations and conventions. Um, so it should be able to be easily applied in the same way. I think the only difference, and Gavin can connect, correct me where I'm wrong, I think the only difference is uh, 
business days uh, for LIBOR included LIB, um, London holidays, whereas um, uh, term so CME term so for is New York holidays. Other than that, I'm not aware of any differences in conventions uh, between the two. So um, I think that um, from where I'm sitting, uh, that uh, CME term so for could be uh, could be used um, the same way that you've been using LIBOR to calculate your upfront discounts. And one quick point of color from my end, and you know, we've seen certainly a lot of different market participants from the trade finance world over the last several months that continue to provide very robust anecdotal evidence that um, CME term SOFR is being embraced. We the number of licenses goes up on a daily, weekly basis, and it's Clearly, the U.S. has taken the lead from a regional perspective, so we're well over half of the total, but all the other regions around the world are responding very strongly. So, um, you know, the pipeline looks pretty promising, and what we've been seeing so far continues to accelerate week in and week out. Great. Certainly, seeing that. Um, I think that there's another question, and I think as people are evaluating, perhaps before there was a term SOFR rate, there was a lot of attention given to compounded SOFR in arrears, which um, can, that's what we were use, using it to make the case that, as Tim alluded to for the need of a term SOFR rate. Uh, there's a question that came in, how closely does term SOFR track to alternative SOFR flavors, example, compounded SOFR in arrears over a uh, like term period? So, so we have we have uh, we have performed some, some some analysis on that, and in, in actual fact, if you if if you look on our um, on our on our web page, we do we do show um, some of the um, additional rates as well um, as um, as as our term, as our term sofa rate. Um, it does it does track. I mean, clearly there are some 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 slight lags in terms of how that data kind of fits together. Um, in terms of whether you're doing uh, an in arrears or whether you're doing um, um, in, in, in advance as well, um, but it does track and um, and 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 perform well um, in 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 those circumstances. And I, and I think what it does is it actually reacts to the to 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 market changes in a slightly um, more effective manner as well. So the other rates tend to catch up rather than um, necessarily. Um, um, uh, lead if you, if you if you get my drift. I mean, given that term sofa is the expectation of um, of overnight sofa, you would expect that to be the case. Great. So, still a lot of questions that are product specific. I'll see if I can kind of address some of them and see if the two of you want to chime, or three of you want to chime in. Um, Diana, one thing that I see that is coming up in a couple of questions is the important distinction about who needs a license. There are references, for example, for you know middle size or small size companies, do they need a license? Um, the distinction that we're trying to, to make is that if you're simply the end user to a transaction or uh, an instrument that is issued that references term sofer, you don't need a license just to be the counterparty or just to be the end user. If you then go on and use term sofer for a number of additional applications or use cases, that's when you need to discuss what you're going to be doing, the, the, the scope of the use of the CME term sofer rate. And that's when we can certainly you know, have a discussion and assess the need for a license. Um, but we know that that's a point that it's, it's worth reiterating. It comes up in a lot of discussions. So hopefully this addresses uh, a number of the, the themes that I see here popping up on screen. And then there's another one in terms of fees being paid through Bloomberg or Refinitiv. Again, when you're looking at an access license and um, to simply uh, access the rate, it can be part of your existing package with the vendor, or uh, you can license it directly with CME. So both options are available. On the licensing front, there was also a question if the licenses are annual or perpetual. It's it's essentially it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a license that has a, um, a a a fixed initial term and then and then then rolls on a uh, on an on, a, on an annual basis. Okay. 
I see another one about term sofa being eligible for clearing. It's it's a great question. Um, not at this stage. CME group clears OTC derivatives that reference sofa, BSB, other reference rates, but not term sofa at the moment. The technology and foundational work to be able to respond to market demand when that materializes is being done. So from a market infrastructure provider standpoint, CME is certainly uh, always focused on what the market needs and demands. Clearly there are liquidity and, and evolutionary and regulatory elements to be considered here, but um, it's certainly something that we're hearing about and that we're preparing for. It's just, we haven't identified yet the, uh, the immediate need, but it's something that we're looking at. And perhaps Gavin, I don't know if you want to add any perspective in terms of the work that your group is doing as well. Yeah, thank, thanks, Marco. Um, so, so yeah, as Marco said, you know, we 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 have um, all of that um, in flight at the moment, and I think, you know, just to to to, to add to what Marco was saying, um, the recommended use of term sofa um, does not include the dealer to dealer market. So it's it's as 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 that starts to grow or, or as that becomes um, permissible under the um, other terms of the ARC, um, I think that we will see more of a demand for um for clearing at the moment the 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 the, the, the transactions that are allowed or the um the otc type transactions that are allowed under um under the recommended use and under our license agreements are for end user hedges um, and so they are fewer and far between in in terms of um, requiring clearing themselves Um, I see one question, maybe this is kind of going back to basics um, to an extent, but might be helpful just as people are becoming familiar with the CME term rate and how it differs from LIBOR. Um, let's see if I can find the exact question. Um, but there is a question, why is CME term SOFA rates lower than LIBOR? What are the differences in components? If you maybe spend a couple of minutes just discussing kind of how the rate is actually developed um, for those who are looking to learn a bit more about what differentiates CME groups term SOFR from LIBOR that our members are more commonly used to utilizing. Yeah, so um, LIBOR itself is based on sort of um, uh, the, um, expected, uh, the expected borrowing of interbanks, um, so bank to bank lending. Um, and um, whereas um, that, that will uh, when, when you look at uh, when you look at, uh, at, at sofa or term sofa, um, that to all intents and purpose is, uh, is 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 risk free or is considered risk free, and so there is a difference in the structure and um, and, and and basis that, that is used to calculate those rates, and and that is why um, there is a um, there is a spread adjustment that the um, that the arc has also. Um, has also endorsed or recommended um, for use in terms of converting one to the other. Yeah, um, there has been some talk and I think there was a question come in regarding the credit adjustment spread and comparing the two. Um, I think that's important. There is kind of an ARC recommendation in terms of what credit spread to use um, the five year Average. Um, there are also some questions that are under discussion by the industry regarding whether we're just quoting term SOFR um, and what credit adjustment spread would be used. Certainly a bank may reference the term SOFR rate and kind of add their own spread, but whether there would be an additional spread added on top of bank spread. Um, I know that this is likely not a, a question or a place where you would have an opinion, um, but just want to state that um, we as an industry are kind of currently tracking other market developments, other vendors who are looking to produce a credit spread that can be used in conjunction with SOFR. One is one being um, contemplated by SOFR Academy, the AXI index. Um, we understand that they may be in a position to begin rolling out something for public use later this month or early next, um, and the other one by IHS Market. Um, but again, that will be a kind of a bank decision. Do not envision that um, that would be a position that CME group would take. They are publishing um, their terms over rate um, that would be up for the industry to, to decide if they'll be leveraging an additional rate in addition to 
their own their own spread. Um, anything else that you guys want to comment on on those questions um, regarding um, you know RFR rates that are quoted in a credit adjustment spread margin over RFR terms of rate, or if you're seeing anything anecdotally from from customers that you're speaking with. I think generally speaking, um, as, as I mentioned before, we are seeing um, and we're seeing an uptake. So we're seeing we're seeing adoption. We're seeing um, we're seeing a number of um, different types of um, institutions and um, you know lenders and, um, and, and 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 another type of activity embracing term sofa and 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 that's that 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 that's really encouraging. Um, and so you know from a from a market perspective, there has been. Um, I think it was um, it was about three months ago now, or certainly it was in in in, in the latter half of uh, 2021. There was sort of a, a, a fairly well publicised sort of loan deal that that um, financing deal that actually um, used Term Sofa as its reference as well. So I think we're we're starting to see um, we're starting to see the market sort of pick up on this, and as we go into um, you know, further into 2022 with some of the recommendations from uh, not recommendations but some of the um the points from the regulators where they're where they're looking for LIBOR transition and they're looking for new transactions not to be referencing LIBOR and to start embracing um the LIBOR you know replacements whether it's SOFA term SOFA or or, or anything else we'll, we'll see that um we'll see that adoption um only continue Maybe a clarifying question here. Um, so regarding the published five-year spread adjustment um, comparing LIBOR to SOFR, is that only for compounded SOFR in arrears or would that also apply to terms of That's a question. Uh, we, we don't produce a five-year rate. We're, we're producing a, uh, the, the, the maximum tenor that we produce is a 12-month rate. Right, right. Um, no, I understand. I'm sorry, I think I misspoke. Um, the historical five-year spread adjustment that's being published elsewhere, not not by you, um, that's used in comparing LIBOR to SOFR. I'm not sure I'm, I'm following the question. Sorry, maybe. Let's see. I think the question was, are there any standardized spread adjustment for transition from USD LIBOR to USD? CME term SOFR um, example similar to the historical five-year credit spread adjustment used for compounded SOFR careers. So I, I think we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier on. There are some um, there are some recommended spread adjustments that that, um, that 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 are being published. Obviously, that's not something that CME. Um, is calculating or publishing we're making our calculations based on the term rate itself and any adjustment or or applicable adjustment to that rate will um will need to be applied um on top of the um the, the term sofa rate itself one initiative diana that we have implemented on the future side of the business recently uh, early january is we're making available on cme globex the matching engine that underpins all the transactions in the futures markets, a new spread contract, SCD, so for to euro dollars, where if someone wants to trade synthetically the spread between a LIBOR reference euro dollar futures contract and a SOFR based futures contract, they can do so in one transaction. And the value of that contract is 26.1 and change. So basically, if you trade at zero relative to the fair value, you've assumed that the spread that the ARC has indicated is the one that you're prioritizing. Obviously, market expectations can vary and prices can, can vary. But we have seen market participants who are typical users of LIBOR reference euro dollar futures use that additional tool to sort of seamlessly through transactions in the futures markets, convert their positions to SOFR futures that are the building blocks through which we derive the term SOFR. So all the different parts of the system are kind of growing and reacting to accommodate these interrelationships uh, being formed and being created. Several other questions. Um, I'll take one, and I know this is something you've spoken to. That we have seen a significant uptick in use 
there's a question um, if you have any market insight about the adoption rate. Um, has CME term SOFA been adopted as a major replacement rate of LIBOR for trade financing loans? Um, you know, to add some context, you know, we are aware, especially before the ARC formally endorsed term SOFA, um, there has been some interest and in, we've seen some market participant begin the process of leveraging other rates that are not LIBOR. Um, but we have seen, as you shared earlier today, some significant uptick. So just curious on kind of your state um, and vision of the market. I mean, one thing that I can share is that being in touch with a lot of different market participants, we have certainly been made aware of some of these deals, but you know, we're not necessarily in a position to share uh, additional insights that specific firms may, you know, share with us um, on one conversations. Um, but it's been very, very busy, and um, there certainly has been and continues to be uh, a lot of engagement. What we're seeing, which is to be expected, not a surprise, is where the increasing number of non-U.S. based lenders and banks, and you know, and the members of the organizations now taking action. Now that the migration of certain other LIBOR reference rates, perhaps sterling or Swiss or other currencies have you know, taken place, getting onto the dollar side of the equation and thinking about business opportunities on the dollar side and therefore the type of replacement rates that they need, hence the engagement with us. So um, that's something that's very visible. Thanks, Marco. Another question um, coming in, what are the regulatory restrictions to use term SOFR and bilateral loan agreements? How is mid-market loan market being defined? I am not aware of particular restrictions as it relates to you know, cash market financial products like loans. Um, but very happy to take that question offline. If, you know, there is a specific instance that is, um, attendee wants to discuss, we can certainly, um, chat offline, but, um, we're seeing a lot of lenders getting ready and, or using terms of, so the market is developing. Yeah. I would just make a quick, uh, comment on that, I guess. Yeah. There's no. According to the ARC, there's no restrictions on using term SOFR for cash products, uh, CME term SOFR for cash products. I think perhaps the question uh, is coming from the fact that the ARC did point to certain asset classes uh, where it felt that CME term SOFR would be particularly useful among them, uh, middle market lending, trade finance, and uh, the syndicated loan market. Um, but that was more of a, a guidance kind of thing or suggested, uh, suggested asset classes where it could make more sense than in other places. But there's no restrictions, as Marco was saying, that we're aware of um, from the ARC on using uh, term SOFA in uh, bilateral loans. I think we might have opportunity for one or two more questions. Um, just seeing one in terms of regulatory guidance, um, the question is, has a cutoff date been decided for all banks to move to SOFR or other reference rates for trade finance products, such as discounting or letters of credit? Um, just want to um, state for our members that our interpretation of the regulatory guidance is that um, as of this year, that no new LIBOR issuance means that for any new LIBOR exposures that would be on a bank balance sheet, banks should be in a position to have already transitioned or effectively transitioning to a rate that it's not LIBOR. Of course, the um, term SOFR is the recommended reference rate. There are other rates available, um, but um, the intention, especially from, from, from the regulatory community, is to ensure that the bank has an effective plan in place um, to transition LIBOR exposures to alternative reference rates effective now. Um, as you are aware, um, um, LIBOR will continue to be published in several tenors through the end of June 2023, but those are to be used according to the regulatory guidance for existing 
um, LIBOR transactions in place, not for new issuance. So that is um, how we are interpreting the guidance and for, for our members, um, kind of the, the, the guidance that you should be utilizing as you're implementing your transition plans currently. Anything else that the two of you would like um, to share specifically on the regulatory guidance for, for use of terms of for moving forward? No, I think I think you've covered it. I think um, it was covered by by my colleagues' comments. I mean, clearly, um, from a regulatory perspective, um, there doesn't there, there, there's not a known restriction on cash market instruments, um, and 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 certainly given its um, its uh, its adherence to IOSCO principles, that 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 provides a high standard of, um, of 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 market practice, and certainly within the UK and the EU, the um, the regulatory approval in terms of um, benchmark regulation and BMR, um, it is available for use within supervised com uh, supervised entities within those regions as well. Okay. So. Another question, um, if an end user or borrower is a non-US bank using trade finance as they're providing financing to their clients, do they need a license? Do lenders need to be concerned about their counterparts obtaining licensing? So um, any, any, any lender uh, will need a license. Um, that is, that, 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 that is as, uh, as, as Marco described as, uh, in, in, in his presentation. In terms of the end user, um, to enter into a loan transaction, the borrower does not need a license simply to enter into the transaction. Um, so if, 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 if the lender is, 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 is making a loan, um, it, 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 that, that, that is absolutely fine. Um, and the borrower will need a license if, as Marco explained, it starts to do other um, activities that require the license as we have described. Great. So I think we just have a few minutes left. I wanted to see if Gavin or Marco, you wanted to make any final comments. I know that we received some questions regarding the, um, the presentation it will be made available to those who registered. This webinar is also being recorded. If you would like to listen to it again or share it with one of your colleagues, you will be able to view it on our website and that should be made available shortly. So just wanted to um, make that housekeeping note, but perhaps any final comments um, from you, Gavin or Marco, to close out our session today? From my end, just want to say thank you. Obviously, it's been a great partnership with BAFT. It's sincerely appreciated, and we also appreciated the feedback that has come from many of your members uh, and the questions and the engagement. So thank you. The last slide of the presentation, that, as you said, will be shared, has the contact information and the resources. We will look forward to continuing to assist you in this process and address your questions. and and issues, so thank you. Yeah, I, I, I echo those thanks, and if any of your, um, any of the BAF members, you know, have specific questions or, or would like to get in touch, then, then, then please, please do so, and myself, Marco, and the team will, 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 will happily sort of work, work through your, your questions and, 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 and hopefully provide you the answers that you need. Great. Well, I appreciate both of your time. I think we were able to get through about 25 questions from the audience. There are a few others that we didn't have time. We have taken note of several technical questions regarding um, usage of, of Term Sofer. I think that is a task for our working group. Um, we did publish a frequently asked questions guide late last summer, um, but I know there are a lot of other questions from our members. So look forward to working with you to providing additional guidance as, as the weeks and months um, continue. Thank you again, uh, Gavin, Marco, and Tim for joining us today. Um, we look forward to being in touch with you members as we all work through the transition away from LIBOR. So thank you everyone for your time today and look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.